for help because we need it. O blessed Lord, You have caused all Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us that we may in such a way hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of Your Holy Word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life which You have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 14, and we continue here majoring on the minors. Uh, We'll be finishing with Malachi. Next uh, Sunday, the conference speaker will be speaking, but he'll be speaking from the minor prophets, which is uh, appropriate. He'll be speaking from Micah next week, but uh, we're in Zechariah this morning, and part of this is uh, when I was asked to kind of direct Uh, the message to somewhat of a preface for the conference that made me think, is there anything in Zechariah that speaks to the relationship of Christians and politics or Christians and the state or Christians and civil government? And I think there is one, and I think it's the text before us this morning, Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, Do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, mighty mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of, God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple, his hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares to spy the day of small things? Since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. Then I asked the angel, What are these two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will admit to you that sometimes the Bible is weird, right? Particularly the Old Testament is often strange ground. In his book, How to Stay Married, Harrison Scott Key speaks about the weirdness of the Old Testament as he was reading through the various books of the Bible. He kind of goes through them one by one. He wrote this, he said, Genesis never disappoints. Crammed as it is with nudity, murder, and many delicious set pieces involving nudity and murder, in addition to DIY boat building instructions. Exodus reads like Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, and the book of Joshua now felt more like Return of the Jedi with the addition of extensive real estate transactions. You get the idea. And he goes on through all the books of the Old Testament, noting their strangeness to us, their foreignness. They are weird. And he concludes this. He says, the Old Testament is mythic and teeming with monsters and death, like hearing your great-grandfather describe what it was like to ride woolly mammoths. That's what it's kind of like, right? You read this stuff, Leviathans, you know, you got whales, you got those... Nephilim, what's going on there? The Old Testament is weird, and it's weird because it speaks to us in a different language. 
Both literally and figuratively, it speaks to us in a different language. Of course, the literal different language is that of Hebrew, which is foreign to us. But it also speaks to us in a different language in a figurative sense. It speaks to us through visions and and metaphors and images. and, And certainly that is true here of Zechariah and Zechariah's prophecy. Zechariah is one of the biggest, uh, is the biggest actually, minor prophet. Some have argued he really isn't a minor prophet. He's a, you know, a major prophet. He has a long prophecy. And one of the notable things about his prophecy are his night visions, these wild and sensational visions that he beholds and takes note of. Among all the prophets of Israel, I'm convinced that Ezekiel and Zechariah were the most likely ones to have experimented with psychedelics, right? I mean, they had some wild stuff, like Lucy in the sky with diamonds kind of stuff. And you get a sense of it right here in this chapter, in this vision of lampstand and, and oil and trees and pipes and bowls and channels. And like, what's going on with all of this? The Old Testament sometimes feels weird. So this morning I want to explore with you this image, this vision, this text from Zechariah, this weird and strange and foreign text, and try to ascertain its meaning, what it might be saying, not only to its original audience, but to us here today in the 21st century, particularly with regard to how we as believers relate to government, the state, to politics. And my outline is really simple this morning, three-point outline, all with the same first letter, three words really. We're going to look first at the image of this text. Secondly, we're going to look at the interpretation of this text. And then thirdly, we're going to look at the implications of this text. So the image, the interpretation, the implications of the text, that will be our outline as we try to flesh this out and understand this weird and foreign and strange land we call the Old Testament. But before I enter into that, just briefly and really briefly this morning, some little bit of context. Mary helped to set that about Zechariah. Where are we? Zechariah, like Haggai, we heard about before last time, uh, was a post-exilic prophet. These are the two big ones, Zechariah and Haggai. In fact, Zechariah and Haggai, their ministries overlap together. And they both have the same central concern in their prophecies, and that is the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the rebuilding particularly of the temple, the house of God, the people of God have returned to the land, everything is in rubble, Every, they're diminished, they don't have resources, they've got this huge task before them, and Zechariah comes along like a life coach to Israel and says, get to work, get this done, build God's house. That's the context of Zechariah's message. Now let's look at our text and particularly let's start with the image. If you could put up that slide this morning, here is a rendering of the image we find in our text. It's not perfect, but it does a pretty good job. It's an interesting image, right? What do we have here? We have a lampstand there, something akin to what we might think of as a menorah, a candlestick that was in the, in the tabernacle or temple, but not quite exactly that. We have these channels and pipes flowing from it. The lampstand itself has seven lights or lamps or candles on it showing forth brightly. Those pipes that come from the lamp that go to this big bowl, that big bowl is They're in turn connected to the two olive trees and oil is flowing into that bowl, into the lampstand, lighting up the area. That's the image that Zechariah gives us. That's what he sees. Anybody got an idea what that means? Yeah, (laughs) I don't know. I mean, uh, Zechariah felt the same way when he saw it. He asked of the angel, you know, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left? He had no idea. And the angel said, you don't know what these things are. And Zechariah, no, I have no idea. 
And the angel says, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord in all the earth. Does that clear it up for you? (laughs) Not really, and it probably didn't for Zechariah either. That's the image that he sees, the image he beholds. And that brings us to point number two, the interpretation. What does it mean? What? Does what, uh, what does this mean, what Zechariah saw, this image? And the most common traditional interpretation that you will encounter is that what Zechariah saw, these two who are anointed, these two trees that feed this oil and bring light and life to the nation, that they are, the two anointed, are the high priest Joshua, who was a high priest at this time, and the king Zerubbabel. The priest and the king. That this is a text about priests and kings. And in favor of that interpretation is certainly this idea that in the Old Testament, priests and kings were anointed, anointed with oil for service in their office. And so we have oil here and we have the anointed ones. And so the connection is this must be Joshua and Zerubbabel, priest and king. And of course, those figures figure prominently in Zechariah's prophecy. Both Zerubbabel, as we see in our text, and Joshua and other places in Zechariah are mentioned. They're key figures, as they would be. And the idea is that here they are, the king and the priest, feeding this oil, lighting the nation. The lampstand is the nation, is the people of God. And of course, at this time, there's a theocracy. There's no separation of church and state. So this is the visible church. This is the nation. This is God's people. And it is the priest and king coming together, uniting hand in hand, who bring light and life to the nation. Matthew Henry will suffice to give us the kind of essence or the gist of this historic interpretation. He writes in his commentary, If by the candlestick we understand the visible church, particularly that of the Jews at that time, these sons of oil, that's the phrase often used, these sons of oil, these two trees, right? these two anointed, these sons of oil that stand before the Lord of the whole earth, are the two great ordinances and offices of the magistracy, that is the state, the king, and the ministry, that is the church, the priest, at that time lodged in the hands of those two great and good men, Zerubbabel and Joshua. That's how this vision has been interpreted historically, this image. That is the interpretation. And based on that interpretation, as you might be able to play out yourself, Many Christians have seen in this text an understanding of the right relationship between church and state, between the magistracy and the ministry, and how when they are joined together hand in hand, walking side by side, that this is how prosperity and light comes to a nation. They see in it an argument for Christian civil government. That it would be for the good of the nation. I was part of a denomination at one time where this text particularly was seen as the key one about, this, about civil government, about why the United States needed a Christian amendment to the Constitution. There's a great old treatise by Samuel Wiley called The Two Sons of Oil in which he lays out this case for Christian civil government. This is a text of priests and kings. But there are some problems with that interpretation, how this has been viewed. There are really two problems with that interpretation. And here I'm relying on indebted to Mark Boda and his work on this text particularly. The first problem with that interpretation that these are priests and kings is the whole word anointing used in this text. That word used here as the two who are anointed really isn't about anointing at all. It's really about the oil itself. The word here is never used anywhere else in the Old Testament to refer to that act of anointing a king or anointing a priest. It is used to describe the kind of nature of unrefined, unmanufactured olive oil. And as an Italian person, I love olive oil, so I know a lot about it. This is good olive oil. Not the stuff you buy, the cheap stuff you buy at Wegmans there. This is the good stuff. 
the extra virgin, right? This is the, the really good unrefined oil. So this really isn't about anointing as we normally encounter in the Old Testament. And if you think about the image, it is not so much that the trees, you know, the two anointed are receiving oil. They're, they're giving oil. Oil is coming from them. And actually the NIV acknowledges this in the footnote where it translates it as an alternative instead of the two who are anointed, the two who bring oil. This is a text about bringing oil, not receiving oil. So that's one problem is the whole idea of anointing. I don't think what's going on here is the anointing of a king and priest, that that's the reference. The second problem is the positioning and posture of these figures. Of these two figures, these two who are anointing, the New Revised Standard Version renders verse 14 this way. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Stand by the Lord. These are those who stand by the Lord. And as Boda correctly points out, that verb and preposition combination, stand by the Lord, is used in the prophetic context. Particularly, it's used in 1 Kings of the prophet Micaiah. That that language, that imagery of standing by the Lord, that verb and preposition are used of prophets, not of kings and priests. And then you add to that what's going on here in the historical context that you have two great prophets of the post-exilic age calling on the nation to rebuild the temple, Haggai and Zechariah. These are the prophets, the two who give oil. And you add to that the fact that in the text, what happens? The word of the Lord is brought to Zerubbabel, right? That's how this interlude happens. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord, verse 6, to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. It's prophecy speaking to the king. It's prophecy that is endued with power of the Spirit of God, right? The connection of Spirit and prophecy is so powerful in the Old Testament when the Spirit comes upon you and gives you utterance. And so all of this comes together, I believe, in a better interpretation to see these two who are anointed, these two who give oil, these two trees as the prophet's Haggai and Zechariah, not Joshua and Zerubbabel, that it is the word of the Lord, it is the spirit of the Lord that is giving light and life to the nation by pouring out the oil of the word of the Lord, calling on the king to do what is right. Now with that interpretation, you might be thinking, well, then what does this have to do with Christians and their relationship to civil government? If that's true, if this is not about church and state or priest and king, but rather about prophets speaking into the nation, what does that have to do with faith and politics, with Christians and the state? Well, that brings us here to point number three, the final point. What are the implications of that interpretation I just give you in case, you know, in the saying that I, if I, what I say here is correct in the interpretation, what are the implications of it? What might this ancient vision say to we moderns today? Well, first, I think there's a connection here, at least in the sense of context it's kind of apropos for our age between Zechariah's day and our own. What was Zechariah and the people of God, what were they dealing with? They were dealing with a new world, a post-exilic world, a world in which they were a diminished people, a world in which they had diminished resources and standing among the nations, a world in which their institutions were in rubble, their former way of life seemed to be a bunch of stones that were, had collapsed around them. They were living, if you will, in a time of upheaval, of drastic change. And certainly I think we can say as Christians living now here in 2024 that we too are living in a time of great change and upheaval and we have been living in it for a while. 
particularly here in our particular situation in the United States for Christians in America. It is a new world, an unprecedented world in many ways, an unsettling world, a world in which things often feel like they are diminished for the Christian, that there is rubble and that there is collapse around us. In February of 2022, in the journal First Things, Aaron Wren offered uh, an article entitled, The Three Worlds of Evangelicalism. The Three Worlds of Evangelicalism. It later uh, was put into book form, entitled, Life in the Negative World, written, uh, published by Zondervan. And in that article, he describes three kind of periods of time, three worlds of evangelicalism, as I use that term broadly to refer to those uh, Christians who adhere to certain uh, dis- doctrines, distinctive doctrines, like the authority of Scripture, the resurrection of Christ, the necessity of salvation, etc. But he describes three different worlds and three different time periods. And the first one is what he refers to as the positive world. This was the world but pre-1994. And in that world, what he says, that was a positive world for Christianity. That's when, in large part, being a Christian was a social positive. That it would actually be something that would enhance certain parts of your life. Your status, if you will. There was a positive view, generally, of Christianity that it was part of being seen as a good, upstanding citizen. And for the most part, Christian morality was often mirrored in large part by the larger society, the norm of society. That's the positive world pre-1994. The second world he describes is the neutral world beginning in 1994 and running to 2014. And in that world, he describes a neutral state for Christianity. It was neither a positive or a negative for you to be a Christian. You were no longer favored, but nor were you disfavored for that. It would have no negative or positive impact on you. It was a valid option among many options of life, not viewed negatively. And and still, for the most part, Christian morality was really mirrored in the larger part of society. This is 1994 to 2014. Sometimes we forget even what we have lived through. We forget that even at this time, you remember the Democratic presidential nominee in 2008, Barack Obama, ran on a platform against gay marriage, right? This was the world, a neutral world, 1994 to 2014. But now, since 2014, Rand argues we are in a negative world. Not that it's a horrible world, he's not using it that way, he's talking about it in regard to how Christians are viewed and how the world in which we live, that society has come now to have a negative view of Christianity, and perhaps you think we have warranted that, and I'm guessing in many ways we have, but being a Christian now can be a social negative, often is, it is something that certainly does not bring one status and can particularly bring one big trouble And certainly moral views, for the first time really, uh, moral views of Christians are not being mirrored in the larger society. This is what he means by a negative world, and this is our world. A world where it seems as if the dominance of Christian morality, of Christians themselves, has crumbled around us like the stones of the temple. I think to myself of just three Supreme Court decisions that really capture this in a powerful way. The, in 2015, the Obergefell decision comes down that, of course, legalized same-sex marriage throughout the United States, a federal kind of mandate from the Supreme Court by a 5-4 to four decision. That has had massive repercussions. There's no uh, you know, coincidence that our denomination and many other denominations began struggling with this issue, and for us it was beginning in 2016, right on the heels of that massive decision that reflected a change in our country. Then in 2018, there was the Masterpiece Cake Shop decision versus the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. That's the cake baker swan. You've all heard about this. Where the cake baker did not want to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. 
and the Colorado Civil Rights Commission acted in such an odious way towards this Christian believer. I mean, there's transcripts of how they spoke about him, about how they spoke about his faith, that in a 7-2 to decision of the Supreme Court, very rare these days, they ruled in his favor and not against him because of that. But it is an image of how negative the view had become of Christianity. And then in 2022 came the Dobbs decision. The Dobbs decision, which overturned Roe v. Wade and sent it back to the states. Let's let democracy decide this, right? And this had been the thing that pro-life movement has been chasing since 1973. And, you know, the proverbial dog caught the proverbial car. And guess what happened? It ain't 1973 anymore. And the, the majority opinion of the country, if you want to leave it to democracy, they will decide in favor of a pro-choice position rather than a pro-life position. And so, you know, people, sometimes people would ask me, why aren't you spiking the ball? Why aren't you happy about Dobbs? Because you don't have any idea what's really going on. Aaron Wren talks about the moral majority becoming the moral minority. Christians are a minority in this country. We no longer have cultural dominance. That is the reality of the situation. And we have been, you know, particularly those who have tied themselves with the Republican Party, loss after loss, and even the Republican nominee on pro-life right now is all over the place because he knows it's a losing issue. Deborah Reinstra, an article I was reading this this past week and was analyzing some data, the biggest kind of denomination in our country right now are those who are unaffiliated with any religion. That's the big one. That's the world you live in. That is the negative world. And the question for us, living as a moral minority, is how then shall we live? How then shall we live? That's why we're having this conference. That's why I'm doing a Sunday school class. That's why I'm preaching this. What, how then shall we live? Well, we have some options. Option one is we can try to seize power of institutions, uh, enforce a minority will on a majority population regardless of the cost to the church, our beliefs, ourselves. We can engage in fostering bargains, political bargains, you know, with people who will tell us they'll do our bidding and give us what we want. That's one option. Another option is we just assimilate. We just go along with the wider culture, adopt its mor- morality. We be with the right-thinking people. We can go to the cocktail parties. We won't lose anything. No negative consequences for our faith. We'll be, as Haggai described, the people of Israel clad in foreign clothes, looking like everyone else, going along to get along. Those both are bad options in my mind. I don't like either of those options. A third option is we can go the Rod Dreher method, the Benedict option one of disengagement where we exile ourselves in little communities, withdraw from the public square and kind of protect ourselves to survive. And there's some appeal to some of that. There's historical precedent for it. There are helpful strategies to it. But ultimately, vacating the public square does not seem like faithful living to me. And it's certainly not along with my Reformed faith. Another option is that offered by Aaron Wren in his book, Life in a Negative World. He offers this three-pronged approach, a really sober and sensible kind of engagement in this negative world. How shall we live? He helps us to see it. And if you're interested in kind of exploring that, I'll be starting a Sunday school class on the 22nd of September, looking at that book. If you want to read along, I'll be teaching on that book for three Sundays life in a negative world. I think he has a lot of helpful things to say. I don't agree with everything in that book, but I think he's presenting a way to live in this world. But there's another option, and we find it here in our text as we circle back to what I will call the Zechariah option. The Zechariah option. And what is it? It's a prophetic option. 
That we as Christians in this negative world must assume the positioning and the posture of the prophet. As we talked about it in this text, Zechariah stood by the Lord rather than standing with the king. Instead of aligning ourselves with the king hand in hand, we should position ourselves toe to toe or face to face as Zechariah did with Zerubbabel, speaking truth to the king, speaking the word of the Lord. This is what you should do. What we should learn to do is to speak the word of the Lord to the king. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. We should recognize how the victory is won, how the gospel persuades. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. That is the word of the Lord. We should neither withdraw from the public square, let people tell us we don't belong there. We have every right to enter the public square, to engage. We should not be shunned from it. But nor should we surrender to the culture around us, giving away and just going along to get along. We should not make alliances with unholy and unsavory politicians and populists who seek to manipulate us as a voting block. What I call for, what I believe the Scripture calls for, is a prophetic political engagement in a negative world, the Zechariah option, which is preach to power. Preach the Word of the Lord. Rely on the power of God in the Gospel. Next week, our conference speaker, I don't know what he's going to say. I don't know if his words will have resonance with mine. But I like the titles of his message on Saturday. One of them is, let the church be the church. The other is, let Christians be Christians. And amen to that. Because that is what I believe the Scripture calls us to be in whatever world we find ourselves living. So, beloved, let us stand by the Lord Let us adhere and proclaim His truth and let us believe that mighty mountains can become level ground. Let us not despise the day of small things because like Zerubbabel, we have the chosen capstone. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the core of the temple that people will one day say of God bless it, God bless it. We have a King. His name is Jesus. He is the Father's Son in whom the Father is well pleased. And the Father says, listen to Him. That is our calling. And if we do that, beloved, oil will flow from the Word of God into the nation, bringing light and life, I believe, for all who believe and embrace it, including the church including those who are yet unpersuaded of the truth, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit. Put your hope in Christ, put your trust in His Word, and live as the prophet lived. Live by the Word of the Lord and stand by the Lord. Let's pray. O Heavenly Father, we thank You and praise You that You are with us in all circumstances. Even when things seem to be shrinking and smaller and the world seems to be collapsing and institutions we trusted in seem to be rubble around us. In such situations as You called Zechariah, You call us to trust in Your Spirit and Your Word and to proclaim them both to the nation, to the King, in the church. Lord, may the oil flow from the words of the prophets and fill our nation with light and life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.